Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Debunking the Missionaries with Rabbi Moshe Shulman. We hit the True Messianic Prophecies Part 3 today. Welcome back, Rabbi. I hope you're doing well. Okay. It's fine. Very good. Let's see how it's going. Oh, I forgot to put up my... I got to post up on Facebook so people know. know yeah, I here. have to go to uh, YouTube and so I can watch any questions that might come in. Sure. That's good. I do have two questions that were here from before. Okay. Go ahead. I'll do my best to answer them. That was a joke. Uh, yeah. All right. See. Okay, so we are set to public. That's good. Everything is set, when right? you see me saying hello in the chat box, then you will know that I am here. Very good. All right. Okay. Oh, fine. I see everything here. Let me make a shameless claim, a shameless appeal for you, William. Okay. That if you're able to, you should you know, donate money to him. Appreciate um, that. I don't know how you do it, but whatever. Those who listen to this live, those who are not listening live, I don't know what we can do. If you're not listening live and you want to, you can donate to me, obviously. It's um, outreach at judaismsanswer.com in uh, PayPal. And you can also donate here if you're not listening live either. <laughs> I think, uh, what, you have, a, you have also a PayPal account, don't you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, it's, it's linked with my website at tenaktalk.com, T-E-N-A-K-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you. Just know, not just us, but anybody who gives classes here. Sure. It's always a considerable amount of time in preparation. You think it, people think it's like really easy to come up with just extemporaneous, but really it's just, it's it, it is more. Right on. Very okay. Good. Um, hello. I just see somebody walked in. We'll start off here. Now, what I want to start with is, as I said, I'll be looking at questions on YouTube or in the chat box um, that are directly related to the issues here that I spoke about or that I think are necessary. Um, so there was a fellow called Dawadin, obviously a um, Muslim who was trying to um, propagate the Islamic religion. So I guess he's coming here because basically we're non-Christians. He doesn't know that we're not Muslims either, but that's because maybe he doesn't know we're not Muslims, whatever. Okay, so he asked a couple of questions that I think one of them is, is definitely very important. Um, and the other one, not important, not just because uh, Muslims use it, because it's 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 used uh, by Christians also, and by both misunderstood. So I will answer his question first, and through answering his question, we will be able to also answer the Christians because they have it partially right, but they don't know quickly. Then he has a second question, which I'm going to uh, address also, which all are based on on errors that are not uncommon among the Muslims who don't really know history and um, <clears throat> don't really know history and what's really going on. So his first question is this. Who is prophet in Deuteronomy 18.18? 18? And the answer is, very simply, it's all of the prophets that came afterwards. Because if we look at 18.18, 18, and let's look at that again here. This is the middle of Moshe, Moses telling to the Jewish people um, you know, what's going to go on in the future and you know, to, to exhort them to keep the Torah. Now, if we go back to verse chapter 18, it's always good to see it in context. Before chapter 18, verse 9 up to um, 14, it's talking about people doing all kinds of things that are associated with false prophets, things you're not supposed to do. Okay, so, and it tells them not to follow after the nations who themselves have false prophets and things like that. Okay, so what does he say also? that this, the context here is talking about the people when they will be living in the land of Israel. Okay? When they will be, not when they're in exile, but when they're living in the land of Israel, they're going to be surrounded by non-Jewish nations, that they're going to be seeing them doing certain things. So what, you know, you know they shouldn't follow them. But then Hashem says also something else. He says that, um, I'll just read it because so we'll go quicker. A prophet in your midst from your brethren, like me, shall Hashem, your God, establish for you. To him he shall hearken. 
Okay? According to all that you asked of Hashem your God in Choyev on the day that the congregation said, I can no longer hear the voice of Hashem my God in this great fire I can no longer see so that I should know. So it was most most of saying like this. If you remember, when they heard the actual direct experience of God on Mount Sinai, they couldn't do it. So they asked Moshe should take their place. So the verse is telling us a couple of things. After telling us we shouldn't follow the nations, the question is, somebody's going to have to keep and guide you. And the guidance is provided, as we talked last week about what prophets do, the guidance is provided by prophets that Hashem sends us from time to time. Okay? And that's exactly what it's saying. So listen, Hashem's not going to speak to you all at once. He's going to send prophets from time to time. Their purpose being, of course, as I mentioned last week, to be moral instruction, to um, warn about bad things that will come because of, of nothing, and also tell you about what's going to be good in the future if you follow Hashem's ways, as Moshe did in the Torah. When we get later, we'll find actually that these things do exist in the Torah itself, the Torah is Moshe itself. But he said it. So the prophets are going to repeat exactly what Hashem, they're going to take Moshe's place exactly like Hashem. Okay? So there were many of them. Okay? And then it's... Uh, In, in 17 to the end, and that gets up to verse 18, it says, Hashem said to him, um, you've done well by saying that, and I'll establish a, uh, an I'll establish a, prophet, a prophet from among them, like you. Now, what's very important is like you means that he's among his brethren, meaning the Jewish people, that the prophet is going to be among the Jewish people. Okay? It has nothing to do with the prophets by non-Jews. This is talking specifically about prophets among the Jewish people, and I'll place words of mountain, if God, God will speak to him. And he'll speak to everything that I will command. And he will follow everything. Okay? Uh, and it says, if you don't follow him, it's going to be bad for you, whatever and ever. Okay? Now, in order to point out what's wrong with the Christians, I'm going to ask, point out what he says here now. He's trying to say this refers to the prophet Muhammad. Okay? And he says that he believes it's talking about Muhammad. There's a few reasons, as I pointed out, that it can't be Muhammad. Number one, Muhammad wasn't Jewish. Okay? He's telling him specifically there's going to be somebody chosen out among the Jewish people. And number two, he said, who's called a prophet today? Well, prophet today, prophet Muhammad. Well, of course they call him prophet Muhammad, but there are many prophets, people, prophets that we, that we had over history. Called Eliyui, the prophet Elijah is called Eliyui Hanubi in Hebrew, called Elijah the prophet. Shmuel Hanubi, if you go to Israel, outside Jerusalem, uh, not very far away, there is a tomb, and it's called the tomb of Shmuel Hanubi. Okay? Sam of the prophet. Okay. There. On the side, which is both in English, Hebrew, and Arabic, it refers to him as Samuel the prophet. So we still refer to people who are long, not, not, not here, like Muhammad has been, died like, you know, uh, 13, 1400 years ago, a long time ago, okay? He hasn't been here 40, and the Muslims who call him Prophet Muhammad, fine, they believe he was a prophet, and Jews and Christians do not believe he was, but they affirm the prophet. But we have many prophets, Ishaya Nubi, Isaiah the prophet, is referred to as Isaiah the prophet. We still do that today. That hasn't changed. So just because Muslims do not refer to these people as prophets doesn't help. I believe that they also refer to Jesus as a prophet, the prophet Jesus. So they also refer, use the title prophet for people other than Muhammad. So I mean, there, there's no specific one here. There's no specific one in, in Deuteronomy 18. In fact, it refers to all the prophets, whether it's Elijah who told them to bring sacrifices on Mount Kalmah, even though it violated the Torah at the time. God said you had to listen to him. And God listens to the president for that. That's what it means. He's going to, Hashem is going to raise a prophet. Elijah is a perfect example. There's other prophets otherwise. But Elijah the prophet is a perfect example because remember, Hashem says in Deuteronomy 18, you're supposed to listen to what he says. Okay? Why we have a, if the prophet comes and says, eat kosher and keep Shabbos, what's the big deal listening? We're already doing it. But the prophet comes and says, for this particular time, you're supposed to make a special thing on this mountain, even though it's not allowed, that's what you listen to for that one time. Okay? So, it doesn't refer to a prophet, special prophet, you know, that, that, that Deuteronomy does not refer to Jesus, even if you can say it was a prophet, it doesn't refer to the prophet Muhammad. It refers to the variety of prophets that were sent to the Jewish people over the periods of time. Next. Um, he says also, and not all prophets were Jews, according to Jews. Uh, that's why there were Jews in Arabia and Mecca and Medina. The learned Jews knew. I have no clue what he's saying, but there were Jews there until there was forced conversions to Islam. Um, he's forgetting that Islam might have spread in the beginning, certainly 
the, the Islamic uh, leaders, the caliphate there, were very imperialistic, and they, while they were somewhat, um, there were somewhat lenient as far as people, still they were very violent in their actions, and um, they were definitely um, forcing people. We know that a lot of people in that area were forced, in fact, to convert over the years of time. So the reason why there were people there was like that. The Jews did not flock to Muhammad. In fact, one of the problems is the Jews did not flock to Muhammad, and that's uh, why certain things changed. They originally prayed toward Jerusalem, for example. We know that. And then they changed it to Mecca because the Jews in Jerusalem didn't want to do it. Um, uh, as far as Jews were in Arabia, Jews, there were more, very few Jews in Arabia. There were actually more Jews in Persia, and of course, uh, in, in the area that was then called Palestine, had been called Judea, the Judea. There were Jews living there. And of course, they were living in all, throughout the Roman provinces. So, you know, Jews were all spread out. Um, they weren't just in Arabia, there were very few Jews in Arabia, and very few Jews followed them. There was actually a Jewish kingdom in Arabia, which was at one time then conquered by the Muslims, and it stopped being a Jewish kingdom. And there was, there was subject to persecution, keeping the region. Um, there were the, the the Muslims, contrary to what a lot of people say, were actually um, did have laws that were persecuted laws and discrimination laws against non non followers. And um, while in the earlier first few centuries they weren't as bad as they would become later on, later on, starting sometime after the, the, the Crusades and specifically when um, the Mongols and the Turks invaded and became Muslims, um, and they came in, they were much more fanatical and um, uh, much more persecutorial. And there were, of course, a number of very well-known instances where forced um, conversions were, did take place. And even where there weren't forced conversions, um, Jews and Christians were um, persecuted in many different ways. Um, they were oppressed. And in fact, the, uh, the Muslim, what people don't know is actually the Eastern churches, which was really where Christianity come from, the Eastern churches that were in the Mesopotamia and Persia and right there, and even went out as far as China, they had been very vibrant until the uh, Muslim conquest. And these places were basically wiped out because the churches were destroyed and the people were either executed or forced to convert. Um, there's a number of books on that subject. It's, it's off our topic here, um, but uh, that's that's the real history of what's going on. That's why people, you know, those disappeared and became Muslim countries because of the kinds of persecutions. But again, um, the Jews didn't accept Islam because Islam is not does not follow according to the Torah. That was basically what it is. Okay. Now, let's continue where we ended last week. So last week we discussed the issue of prophecies in general. What prophets come to do? And we gave a few examples of what it is. Um, again, the three the three main things that prophets come to do is number one, to w tell people about the sins they're doing, how they, especially specifically the upper classes who the prophets went to, that the upper classes that you know you are going away from what Hashem wants to do, which was um, unfortunately very common in the northern kingdom of, of Israel, and in the lower, uh, southern kingdom of Judah was too common. But it wasn't as common. We, there were intermixings of, of very, very righteous kings with kings who um, did veer from the path away, away from the path of Hashem. So that was one thing to do. The second thing I did is to warn constantly that there are going to be um, destruction that's going to come upon them, and that's constantly throughout the prophets. Speak of any prophetic prophetic book, you have that. And the third thing is to tell us the rewards of the future. And I did mention that, you know, while there were many prophets, more than what we have books, we don't have a book of Samuel, of his prophecies. We don't have the book of Elijah, of his prophecies, although he did prophesy. Um, we only have, like, you know, things in, but we don't have, like, future prophecies, what's going to happen. It doesn't talk about it. It talks about very immediate events. Whereas the other prophets that we have are always talking about future events. So we have these prophets now. They were chosen out by... Um, are what we call now rabbis, but they had different names when we were in Persian exile. The books that we would have, which becomes together, Atanach, which comes in the Persian exile after the Babylonian exile when it was in the Persia. These become Atanach, um, as we can see, because the last of the prophets that we have, Malachi, was actually in, per in the Persian Empire when they were actually going back to Israel. So in, 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 in that was when it came together. And the books that were taken, besides the Torah, were books that were going to teach us things that we need for lessons for today. 
So when we have a book in the Bible from the Tanakh, it's there because it has something for us to learn today, except, except for the Torah, which the Torah is there is to teach us specific things with one. Um, so the Torah has, but after that we have Joshua, Judges, and Kings, which is really what it's referred to as sacred history, but it's not. It, it's not sacred history in the sense of if someone was to write a history of the United States over that period, it would be huge and much more than that. What it is is, is it has those parts of the history that are important for us to know and remember for future. And unfortunately, the reason is that most of the things that we're told to remember is where um, the Jewish people veered away from Hashem's path, but Hashem sent somebody to bring them back to the path, because that's what we have to remember now. Is that if, the Jewish, if you do go away from the path, you know, God forbid, then there's always going to be something. So that's what prophecy is. So in distinction from that, in distinction from that, we have what's called end-time prophecies. Now, these are specific types of prophecies within the prophecies these prophets give, okay? And end-time prophecies mean specifically, what we mean by specifically, these are prophecies that have to deal with a future end-time, when things would come to end, certain things would come about, okay? So, um, there's a very bizarre statement from Dr. Brown in, in, in his book, it's, I think it's second volume, um, about Messianic prophecy. And it, it's bizarre in the sense that, I'm going to read it to you, and if you think about it a second, it's in, excuse me, in volume 3, page 189. This is what he says. There is not a single verse in the entire Hebrew Bible that is specifically identified as Messianic prophecy. No other scriptures say the next paragraph pertains a prediction of the Messiah. Thus, whether or not one accepts a certain passage as Messianic depends largely on how one understands the person and work of the Messiah. Now, taken before showing what's wrong with this, just take it as he's saying it. So what he's saying is basically, God never really predicted the Messiah. We are all reading into it what we want the Messiah to be, what we think the Messiah should be. There really is nothing. We, can't, we, not, we cannot pick it up and see where it's clear what the Messiah is. When the, so, so when Hashem says that everything he's going to do, he reveals to his prophets, or when, when things like that, what it says in, in Devorim, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, the hidden things are for Hashem, but the revealed things are for us. And obviously the Messiah is a real thing that's supposed to be real for us. That, that's not really true. He doesn't really reveal it to us. It's hidden. There's no way of knowing. It's only what we are imposing onto the text. Okay. That's good. So if that's the case, then, then how can you even argue that Jesus is the Messiah? What's his proof for it? Because he wants to read into the text what he wants? Everybody can read into the text what they want. We know that goes on all the time. Everybody knows. I'm not talking about Christians. Everybody knows there's people who pick up the text and they read into whatever they want. Jews and Christians believe that Muslims read into the text something that's not there, that they want to say that Muhammad is there. And Jews and so Christians you read into the text. So everybody says somebody else is reading into the text. So if there's no objective way of knowing what it is, how can you argue and say, tell somebody that this is the, the Messiah if you don't believe in going to hell? I mean, how can you do that? How can you say that Jesus is the Messiah? I mean, we, we could close the book and say, listen, the, the Bible doesn't tell the Messiah is, so obviously it's not important to know what it is, and that's it. If God would have wanted us to know, he would have told us clearly what it is. He doesn't tell us, so it's probably not important. We should just live our lives we're supposed to live our lives, and that's it. I mean, that's basically what he said. That's the bottom line we're saying. The problem is, is as we, we talked about beforehand, and that is the word Messiah, meaning what we mean now, of course it's not in the Tanakh. You know why? Because that is a word made up in the second century, the second temple period of time, late second temple period, that we make up to mean something. It denotes something in the Tanakh which has a specific meaning, and that's what we're going to see what it is. And we will say that this it means Messiah because this, this specific person who's mentioned specifically in the Tanakh was called later on Messiah. Of that, there's no doubt about it. At the point of the Dead Sea Scroll, they have three messiahs, one of Israel, one of, of Aaron, which is a priesthood, and one who's a prophet, which is Elijah, Elijah the prophet. We're going to see where that comes out from. But, but, so the reason why I call him Messiah is because of, not because of, Tanakh says that there's somebody, a special person, explicitly, and we're going to see those explicit discussions. And we just call that person Messiah. Just like, for example, today, we refer to rabbis, okay? But there were... No rabbis in, 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 the, in the Tanakh. There were no rabbis in the early period uh, until, the, you know, 
uh, after the first century um, in the common era. So where does the name come from? It's a name that we use now. In fact, that name was not always used. Now we use rabbi for something, even among the Sfar, Sfardim, who rabbi wasn't the use that they used for their, their scholars who knew the law. They called them Chachamim. But that's a different story. The point is, is that his point is a point which is, 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 is has a logical fallacy, which is that he's trying to read back a word we say now and say, well, because that word wasn't used then, that it didn't exist. Okay, and as we pointed out earlier in uh, last week, the week before that, that <coughs> the names that were used are Second Temple period of time. Many of these things came. So Messiah is a term that became of use in the Second Temple. It was never used in the First Temple period of time. There was known, as we're going to see, there was known that there's going to be a special person, but this special person is known because he's associated with the end times. Okay. This is very important to know, and we're going to actually deal with this. This special person who's associated with the end times, this is the person that we call the Messiah, because it was essentially post-biblical. And uh, we didn't mention a few sources here that, um, like, like uh, John Collins, a, a, a scholar who points it out, but we, we could point it ourselves, and we can actually say, okay, Tell me, tell me literature where it appears. The, the, the word Messiah does not really appear in any of the pseudopigraphs from earlier period of time that I know of. I don't know Messiah. But there is, they give other names to the person who we will eventually call Messiah. Okay? So it's very important to know that, that that is a false argument. But it's not only a false argument, it destroys them because if there is no objective reason why we should call a person, specific person Messiah, then the, the term has no, no meaning to it. It's just a word which had a meaning. So why are we arguing about anything? It's because there is some kind of a meaning there. He's just saying, okay, I don't want to accept that meaning. I'm accept that meaning. Now, in fact, in parlance, the usual parlance, messianic age and end times are really the same. Okay? So when a Christian talks about the end times, you know, especially evangelicals, people who even in, in, in a tribula a tribulation, pre uh, post trip appearance, they believe there's going to be a period of time, which is called the end times, when the Messiah is here on the earth ruling. Well, that has similarities in the Tanakh. We'll see that it's taken from the Tanakh, the only end time, because there are end times prophecies, but, but there's no pre end time prophecies of the Messiah. We're going to deal with that issue. And in fact, I will uh, giving, be giving a challenge to Christians on that issue, but we'll leave it at the moment. Don't don't answer me with their challenges, all the verses. First, you have to hear what my challenge is if I get up to it. Okay? So these are end-time prophecies. Now what, how do we know something's end-time prophecy? That's a very good you, you can throw it, again, Brown says there's no way of knowing what this mess, who's going to say, fine. But we can talk about the end times. And in it, we're going to find a person, and that person, we're going to give him later on the name Messiah. So we could say this, the person of importance in the end time. Is, a is what our definition is going to be the Messiah. Now, the Christians might want to have another thing. I'm going to ask them to prove it later on, and I'm going to give specific ways that they can prove it. They can answer me whatever you want. You can call on the web, try and answer it. But, however, we're going to start here. There is an end times period. Nobody disagrees there's an end times period. Within that end times period, is there a specific person? And that person we later call the Messiah. In essence, Christians do not, Dr. Brown will not disagree that these verses that I'm going to point, these, things, these passages, not verses, that I'm going to point out are actually dealing with the Messiah, that they would agree that's the Messiah. That's what Jesus is supposed to do when he comes back. Okay? That's what, okay? what I'm going to deal and I'm going to show is actually there's no first time. There's only one time. That's it. But the point is, okay, how are we going to know what a verse is end times prophecy? You can see all kinds of verses thrown out to you by Christians. That this is talking about the Messiah. And you read it and you scratch your head. So you're going to ask me, okay, you're going to tell me what the Messiah is supposed to be like. And he's the person who's important in the end times. Please tell me specifically what you mean by end times prophecy. How do you know this end times? Well, there's actually four categories. The first one is an explicit reference. And we will shortly get to some of those where it says specifically it will happen in the end of days. The word end of days is used. Okay. 
in end of days. Now it states explicitly that this is going, referring to a specific, specific time and calls it the end of days. So we know that that's something that's going to happen in the end of days. No Christians would argue against it. In fact, the, the verses that I'm going to bring here, there's no Christians essentially that are going to argue against them. At least the ones that I'm trying to make sure there's, there's none. It may be some of them might come up with this, and we'll, we'll argue about that more specifically later. But the verse, what we're going to be, I'm not dealing with verses here, I'm dealing with passages. Because um, one of the problems with Christians, when they talk about this is a messianic visible movement, is because, in, in fact, the, 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 the Tanakh is not, a collection of verses. It's not like Proverbs, okay, where there's a verse here, you know, one verse is maybe two or three verses, and they just have a topic and then it jumps out to a different topic. But no. The Tanakh is stories, it, it's it, it's passages. These things all fit together. It's it's not verses, it's a passage. And if you look at a verse without looking at the passage, you have no clue what's going on. So when we talk about things, we're talking about passages. I don't want to hear about a verse. If you can quote a verse, Verse at least three verses, tell me three verses beforehand and three verses after. Let's read the whole thing in context of this. Okay? Then we can talk about it. Okay? We're going to do an, an end times prophecy. Number one is explicit passage that says explicit. It starts on the passage. In the end uh, times, this is such going to happen. Usually it says, starts as Shem said to the prophet. In the end times is what's going to happen. So that's an explicit prophecy. Number two, I call implicit. Why is it implicit? While it does not use specifically end at times, it'll sometimes say the days are coming, or it mentions a prophecy that something's going to happen and it's going to be never ending, or in such a sense in the future time, in such a way that it's both similar to end prophecies that say specifically it's end times, but it's also that cannot be in another time. It cannot happen twice. Okay? So, for example, it says that in the famous prophecy, of course, it says in, in Isaiah 2, 2 through 4, it says that they the plow their, 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 their swords into the, into the plows and the, nobody's going to make war anymore. It's not going to be war ever, ever again. OK, that can only happen once. OK, an end of war can happen only once, because if it happens, if, if there's a temporary peace and war happens, that means you didn't end war. Right. Temporary peace is the way to end war. But ending war means something's happened. So that is a, a, an implicit type of message of prophecy. It says something that, from reading it carefully, it's saying something that's going to happen and will never be overturned again. Okay? Now, contextual references, uh, refer, mess, contextual messianic problem, uh, end times prophecies, are very simple to implicit, but it doesn't say things like days are coming. It doesn't, but it still has things which are multiple, um, multiple points that we find in explicit and implicit prophecies. Okay? Multiple points that we find in explicit and implicit prophecies. Okay? Um, and we're going to have examples. Every time I bring a passage that is a prophecy of the future, I will tell you specifically, oh, this is, this is only a contextual prophecy because it brings these five points that we know from other places that are, are explicitly at the end of times, and they can't happen again. Okay? The, the last one are called other end times references. These are a little bit weaker. Sometimes there is contention, especially in the book of Isaiah from 40 to 66. There's some prophecies. Um, it talks sometimes about the return from Babylonian exile. Sometimes it's talking there about the end of, of, of uh, the actual end of time. So, for example, Isaiah 53, which we're going to talk about in depth, both in the superficial level and also in a very in-depth level. Um, it mentions things that we understand it to be referring to end times. In the end times, this is the way we're going to look back in the past and stuff like that. And we'll discuss why it's not about the Messiah, but it's about the missing period. Okay. But this other passage, for example, talks about Cyrus and the Jewish coming back to it. So it's mixing together both end times and non-end time prophecies. So in time, there's a mixture. In time, it's not. There's many, uh, there's many prophecies we see. There's times that we say, for example, prof um, promises that are given. Um, that are given to the Jewish people, for example, the Jewish people are given a promise that the land of Israel will be theirs forever. That has not been fulfilled yet. We've had temporary times there, but it's not been fulfilled. So we know that's going to be, uh, is apparently being pushed off the end of the lives. And we see, of course, other places which agree with it, that's what's going to happen. But, so we, I call this other end times prophecies because while they do give information and they, they do appear to be end times prophecies, they're on a little weaker level. So again, what we have here, let's do the categories again. We have explicit 
end time prophecy with explicit references to the end of times, where it says, in the end of times, such and such is going to happen. And there's implicit ones where it'll say the days are coming, and it, it says prophecies of specific future things, which clearly mix together and are, are con, uh, consistent and appear to be the same as an explicit. There are contextual references where the context itself says things are going to happen that can only happen in, in the time period. As I mentioned, I say two, two through four is a good example of that. And then other ones which are like promises or prophecies which look to be like that, but they're not as strongly worded or they're just straight, straight promises. And we're going to come up with a few of those. Okay. Um, let me take one second and see if anybody has a question. This is no one to move on. Any question of anything in what I said? Let's take a look also. But just a quick question, then I'm going to go on. Very good. And thank you guys, uh, Mr. Chris Taz. Appreciate that donation. It's very generous of you. Yes, thank, yes. You. I, I, thank you very much for giving money to William. That's very much. And Wally, we appreciate you it. Um, those who came in late, remember that uh, we have shameless appeals. <laughs> To, uh, for money for William. Well, for you too. I mean, really, it's all. We're, this is all a joint effort. It really, really is. You know, um, Judaism. Okay. Judaism'sanswered dot com. If you go there, you'll find an option uh, available to do a donation there. Does actually, well. I haven't put the option there yet, which I don't know why. But so, my, how do they? How do they donate? My PayPal get, is, is outreach at dot com. Okay, cool. There you go. I'm trying to get somebody to do my web page and do updates. I'm looking for that. Okay. Um, very good. You know. Somebody who'll do it for a good price, which is under 25 cents. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, Somebody okay, says so let's they... go on to the next thing we want to do. Okay, go ahead. Um, okay. I didn't see any questions specifically about what I One's probably fiction to come in now from a hob ever. Uh, he just, he just, uh, it's just up there. You might see it here in a few seconds. Go ahead with your okay. question. Well, we'll let me just do the next a little bit, and I'll come back and look at it, because I, this, okay. this, this shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Fair enough, fair enough. But it is important. Okay, so now that we've had this, what we need to do is examine, as we go through these prophecies, which we're going to, as we go through the Tanakh, um, okay, ever that that's not really related to what we're talking about now. Um, so I don't really, I would really like to keep only questions that are related to what we're doing. Okay. Um, if we're going to look at these passages, end times passages, and stuff like that, we really want to keep in mind what distinguishes the Jewish belief, Jewish messianic belief of the Messiah in the end times, and the Christian belief of the Messiah in the end times. Okay. That's very important. Um, that we should keep these things in mind. That's one, one of the most important ones. Okay, so let's deal with it. What's the Jewish view? Number one, the Messiah will be a human king. He will be a descendant from the house of David, obviously, but he will be a human. He will be a very important person, uh, but he will be like you and me. You know, he will, you know, he'll have long pants like I have and a nice beard and stuff like that. And that's what he will look like, okay? Just as our ancestors looked like that, okay? Number two, um, when he comes, the exile the Jewish people have now will be ended forever. Even when the Jewish people came back in the second temple, a large amount of people were still in exile. And the temple was destroyed. So, we, you know, the Jewish people are still in exile today. And even though in the land of Israel there's a lot of Jewish people living, a lot of people are in exile. And there's many other factors about the land of Israel right now which do not fulfill what's going to happen in the end times. So we know one of the things is that the exile will end, will be over forever. Okay? Number three, which relates to that, is it going to be peace in the world? The world will be a peaceful place. So when you open up your, your newspaper in the morning, it's going to be very, very boring. There's going to be nothing interesting happening, except maybe sports or whatever is going on, who won, who won the World Series or something like that. But basically, it's going to be very boring. Newspapers going to be very boring. I don't know what they're going to do then. They're going to go crazy. They're not having anything to write about because it just be peaceful all the time. In addition to peace, of course, there's going to be a temple. The, on, on in Jerusalem, where the temple is now, 
there will be a new temple where they will have sacrifices again as they were before. And it will be a place where, where non-Jewish people can come from all over the world and worship the God of Israel and even bring sacrifices and, of course, join in the prayers and sacrifices that are out there. Okay? That's what the Messianic Age is according to Jewish understanding, and that's who the Messiah is. The Messiah is the main person in that time, and as I mentioned, the rabbis point out other people that are there. But the Messiah, when you use the term the Messiah, as opposed to a Messiah, we usually refer to the Messiah who's going to be the king. And that is specifically what he's going to be the king. He's going to rule over the whole world. And he's going to be a human being like you and me and everybody else. Right? Now, the Christian view is much different. Number one is that there's two comings. He's going to come once in order to die. And then he's coming back later to rule. So they can they can appropriate much of the, the prophecies that we talk about um, about the Messian end times period into their theology. I always evangelicals do this dispensationalists um, who do not believe in supersessionalism and reject the Jewish people completely. They can actually appropriate some of those in ways that the Jewish people so believe. So you see people who are Christians, Jewish Christians will, will say that. Okay, that's number one. Number two, they believe in the virgin birth. That means that the Messiah is not going to have a human father. Now, of course, that causes problems with ancestry and for, as far as being a tenant of King David and stuff like that, which we mentioned a little bit of that before in another lecture. And it'll come up again when we try and talk, discuss about some prophecies and stuff in Dr. Brown's books. Number three, his purpose is in order to atone for people's sins. OK, it's not that the people are going to repent and then the Messiah will come. The Messiah comes in order to bring the people to some for the sins. Number four, his primary purpose is for the next world after you die. OK, if the Messiah doesn't come in my lifetime, he doesn't come in my lifetime. That's a Jewish view. He just didn't come in my lifetime. We didn't merit that he should come. But as far as my place in the world to come, there's nothing to do with that. Whether it comes or not, I'm still assured of, you know, if I keep the commandments and keep them sin and repent and stuff like that, then I, yeah, we'll have the world to come. We're going to do a whole thing on sin and atonement to, to, to more clarify some of these issues. So I don't want to go into it because I could take hours and hours and hours on that. It's something that we need to do in depth. But, you know, it has nothing to do with it. Messiah doesn't come. He doesn't come. And that's, that's, that's all there is to it. It has nothing to do with me going to heaven or not. For Christians, the Messiah comes because he has to come in order to, be, to bring atonement. If he doesn't bring atonement, you, you, can't, you don't have a place in the world to come. You go to hell. Okay, and finally, whereas the Messiah on Jewish people is to spread the knowledge of Hashem, the God of the world, the Messiah is actually spending, spreading the knowledge of himself. When he first comes the first time, you have to believe in Jesus. You have to believe in him and his mission. It's about him. And this is fundamentally what the difference is between the Christian view and the Jewish view. The Christian view is it's about the Messiah not about what happens around, it's about the Messiah. And the Jewish view is, it's about the age. And what happens around that is, is, is important, but that's not what it's about. It's about the age, and he's a person of that age. Whereas when it's Christians, it's about the Messiah and, and, and everything, everything about it. Now what we're gonna see is fundamentally that this is not what the Tanakh teaches. The Tanakh teaches as the Jewish thing is, it's about the age, and this guy is, is in a time. Okay, before I continue, there was an, there's an interesting question here from Janice. Asks, um, sorry if this is a stupid question, but how will we be informed of the arrival of the prophet Elijah who heralds the Messiah? Well, he'll be wearing his button that says, I am Elijah the prophet. Now, we'll, we'll know who he is, okay? There will be signs and ways that we will know that he's Elijah the prophet. Just like the Messiah, we will know who it is because there were things going on around us. Elijah the prophet is going to come and there are going to be things going around us. Again, it's not about the people. It's about what's going to happen at that time. And the people are just one of those players in that time. And that's a fundamental error Christians have. And then something fundamental, if there's anything you remember from today, if there's anything you want to, can remember from today, it's that what's important is the time and not particularly the names of the person. 
who asks a question, it's the person, not the end time. That's why, we, you know, there's a Jewish belief that the Messiah can come at any time. Why? Because it's not the person himself, it's the time. So there can be a person who is qualified to be the Messiah at any period of time. He could come any time. Because many people could be, over the years, could have been qualified to be the Messiah. But the time was not the right one. When the time comes, there will be a person there who could be Messiah. But for the Christians, there's somebody who's not, it's the person who's important, not the time, the person who's important. These are fundamental differences. When Christians and Jews talk about the Messiah, they're talking about totally, they're in totally different worlds. Because Christians understand the Messiah as it's the person that's important, whereas Jews understand it's the time that's important. Okay? Very fundamental. It's something that you should always try and remember, always, always, always. When you, if you're a Christian, you should remember it. And if, if, if you're a Jew and you're hearing from a Christian, you should always remember that that's very, very important. Okay? Um, somebody asked me, Elisha, we reincarnated with God. There's no reason for him. Elisha went up alive, and he still is alive. We just don't know where he will come here. Okay? Okay. Now, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to read five passages. Just five passages. Each of these tell us about what's going to happen in, in, in the Messianic period, in the end times. So the first one I want to read to is um, Deuteronomy 4, 25 to 31. What I want you to read it is because those of you who are Christians, those of you who are familiar with Christians, when I read these five passages, I want you to consider back Ignoring Isaiah 53 and Daniel 9, which is an exception, have you ever heard from a Christian quoting to you a passage, the nature of this, which so clearly shows the Christian view as these show the Jewish view? I want you to think about that. Have they ever read to you a passage like this that shows the Jewish view as much as, you know, shows the Christian view as much as these will show the Jewish view? So the first one we're going to look at is Deuteronomy 4, um, 25 to 31. Okay. Now this is an explicit end of days commentary. I'm going to read it in English now. Um, when I go over it later on, when I go through the whole Tanakh, I'm going to actually do more in the Hebrew to, to give you a clear understanding of what it is. Um, but now we'll do that. Uh, so verse 25, when you beget children and grandchildren and have been long in the land, you will grow, oh, this is Deuteronomy, remember Deuteronomy is before they go into the land. Okay? So, the saying, when you beget children and grandchildren and will have been long in the land, you will go corrupt and make carbon image of anything and you will do evil in the eyes of Hashem, your God, to anger him. We see that this actually happened. And the later prophets tell us about this and warn them about it. I appoint heaven and earth this day to bear witness against you that you will surely perish quickly from the land to which you are crossing the Jordan to possess. You shall not have lengthy days upon it. Okay? Those who are familiar with the prophets know that in fact the prophets told many times that the Jewish people who were, you know, because of the leadership, Isaiah and other place, you will go into exile. For you will be destroyed. Now destroyed doesn't mean permanently, of course, because later prophets make it clear that. Hashem will scatter you among the peoples and you'll be left few in number among the nations where Hashem will lead you. Jewish people are very few in number right now. Had the Jewish people not been persecuted, we would have been maybe as big as the Chinese now. But because of the persecutions and all of these things happen, Hashem has always made the Jewish people to be small in number. There you will serve gods, the handiwork of man, wood and stone, which do not see and do not hear and do not know smell. So the Jewish people go into exile and many of them will get involved in idolatrous worship. So 29 is what's important. From there you will seek Hashem, your God, and you will find him. Okay, so in the exile, they will eventually turn to Hashem. If you search with him, all your heart and all your soul. When you are in distress, when bad things happen to you, and you think about it, and all these things will follow you at the end of days, you will return unto Hashem, your God, and hearken to his voice. 
For Hashem your God is a merciful God. He will not abandon you nor destroy you. And he will not forget the covenant of your fathers that he swore to them. Okay. Spears was about more other things, but this, this is basically. So what you see here is that in the end of days, what's going to happen? The Jewish people are going to repent. He's not going to forget them and fulfill the promises, which he promised Abraham, Abraham, and Jacob, that they shall dwell in the land of Israel. Okay? So we see here a few things that are fundamental. Repentance and the Jewish people, I forgot, the Jewish people will be God's people. He will not forget them. And they'll be brought back to the land. Okay? Basic Jewish concept of end times 101. And where does it appear? It actually appears in the Torah itself. In the Torah itself, we know that's going to be Messianic age. Messiah is not mentioned. Why is Messiah not mentioned? Because the Messiah is not the important thing. The important thing is the period of time. And it says clearly, end of days. It talks end of days. No two comings, no anything like that. Clearly end of days. Okay? Let's go to the next one. I don't know if I'll be finished all five. I want to do five because I want you to see how clearly things are. Next one is going to be Isaiah 2, 2 through 4. I mentioned it earlier, so I'm just going to read it now. Inside, what it says here. Point out what it has, and we'll do a little bit more on it later on. Again, I will read it in English. And it will happen in the end of days. Again, the prophet says clear what's going to happen. What's going to happen then? The mountain of the temple of Hashem. Okay, it refers specifically to the temple of Hashem. The house of Hashem is what it is in Hebrew. We'll talk about that later. Temple of Hashem will be firmly established on the head of the mountains and it will be exalted above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Okay, many, so many people will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Hashem, to the temple of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For from Zion will the Torah come forth and the word of Hashem from Jerusalem, not from anywhere else, from Jerusalem, he will judge among the nations and will settle the arguments of many people. So I'll, I'll bring everything. He will bring peace among the nations and they shall beat their swords into swords into plowshares and the spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift sword against nation and they will no longer study warfare. Okay? End of days. What's going to happen? Again, we see some similarities to what happened before and some differences. Here we find end of days talks about the temple, talks about world peace, talks about people coming to worship in Jerusalem. And 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 all the Jewish people come together there. Okay, clearly with not any ambigu 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 ambiguity at all. Okay, Sai isn't even mentioned here. At the end of the days, if you read this, you you wouldn't even know there's going to be Messiah in the end of the days, because Messiah is not important. Even for Christian theology, there's going to be an end times, you know, those people in the tribulations, there's going to be end times of the kingdom. Jesus is the most important thing of that, right? But when you look at end times prophecy, it's not. Messiah's not even important there. We will see prophecy of Messiah is mentioned. I'm not saying this Messiah is not going to be mentioned. But it's not the Messiah that's important. It's the period of time that's important. The end times is a period of time that's important. The Messiah is just having to be present there. Messiah's walking around today. There's somebody walking around today who could be the Messiah. Won't be me because I'm a Levite. But it's somebody who's the son of King David who could be the Messiah today. We don't particularly know him because it's not the time for him to know. We don't need to. But at any time he could be here. Okay? Because it's not the person that's, it's the period of time. When the time is right for that period, then there will be the Messiah. We don't have to worry about who this is. It's not important. What's important is what's going to happen then. Repentance, return to Hashem. Okay? Next one we want to look at is in Jeremiah. I only took out one prophecy from each prophet that I'm going to address because um, I don't want to get hung. We're going to find that many prophets have multiple, but I just want to do that are specific, explicit prophecies. Jeremiah 30, 1 through 25. So let me get up to there. Well, I see it's getting late, so the last two I might have to leave for next next time. Jeremiah 30, 1 through 20. This is pretty long. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from Hashem saying. So Hashem is telling us this. Thus said Hashem, God of Israel, saying, Write down in yourself all these things that I am telling you into a book. For behold, days are coming. The word of Hashem. 
When I will return the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, return my captivity means I will bring them back from exile, referring to both Israel, the northern kingdom, and Judah, the southern kingdom. And I will return to the land that I gave their fathers, and they will possess it. So going back into the land. Again? Return of Jewish people together. These are the things Hashem spoke in Israel and Judah. With us, said Hashem, a sound of terror have we heard and a fear and not peace. Okay? And now, and see if a male has ever given birth. Why do I see that every man puts his hand on his loin like a woman and child with his face open? The time is a time of extreme trouble. Wars. It's going to be a time of a horrible suffering. Woe for that day will be momentous. There's nothing like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he shall be saved from it. Okay? So there'll be a time of troubles, but he'll be saved from it. Saving in the Tanakh means not saving your soul. Saving from physical problems. When your soul is saved, it means you've repented and been atoned for. That's what it means. It shall be on that day, the word of Hashem, Master of Allegiance, that we will break off the yoke of the conger from your neck, and our tear the straps and forms will no longer enslave you. Jesus will not be subjected to anybody else. Israel right now it has to worry about the United Nations, has to worry America, has to worry about this. When Mashiach comes, I don't have to worry about anybody. They will serve Hashem their God and David their king, whom I will establish over them. So again, the Jewish people will serve Hashem. We saw this before already. And also, first time we hear here, David the king. Who's David the king? Not King David himself resurrected. King David means referring to the uh, king who will be in the time. But as for you, do not fear, my servant Jacob, the word of Shem. And do not be afraid, Israel, for behold, I am saving you from distant places. Saving you from distant places means saving means in the Tanakh. Not saving from sin, but saving, rescuing. And your descendants from the land of the captivity. And Jacob will return and be at peace and tranquil. And none will make them afraid. For I am with you, the word of Hashem, to, do, to, to save you. For I will bring annihilation upon all the nations among whom I have dispersed you. But upon you I will not bring annihilation. I will chastise you with justice, but I will never go make you be. So again, exile was that, and the exile will end. Continues. This chapter is beautiful. But it tells you everything. I'm reading a whole chapter because you have to say, with us, Hashem, your injury is grave, you were to a queen. No one judges you wounds to have a cure. Medication may be not said. So all the nations tell the Jewish people that there's no hope for them. No hope for them. Sounds like Isaiah 53 a little bit, doesn't it? All your paramours have forgotten you. They do not acquire after you. For I strike you the blow of an enemy with a cruel reproof because of the many sins you transfer with them numerous. How can you cry out over your injury or, or your pain, over your pain that is a grave? It is because of your many sins, your transgressions that are numerous. So I have inflicted upon these upon you. You will see that this is exactly what Isaiah 53 is about. Somebody doesn't know I'm still continuing. Okay. Now that's all who devoured you shall themselves be devoured. All who oppressed you will call, go into captivity. Who trampled you will be trampled. All who despoiled you I shall deliver to become spoils. It's also mentioned as everything, by the way. For I will, cure, will make a cure of you, and I will heal you from your wounds. For the word of Hashem, for I called you discarded. Say, so she, uh, she is Zion, who no one cares about. Thus said Hashem. Behold, I am returning the captivity to the tents of Jacob. I will mercy on, on the, his abodes, and the city will be built upon itself, and the palace will sit in its proper place. The, thou, the sound of thanksgiving, the sound of merrymakers will emanate from them. I will multiply them, and they will not be diminished. I will make them heavy of number, and they will not dimin dwindle. For his sons will be beloved as in the past, and his assembly will be established before me. I shall deal with all those oppressors. His leader will be in his midst. This is referring back to the Davidic king or something. And his ruler will emerge from within him. I will bring him close and emerge from him in him. Will, the rule, his rule will emerge from within him. Remember, said, emerge from within him. Okay, that's why I said in every generation there's somebody. He will emerge at the proper time. I will bring him close, and then I will be able to approach me. For who then will embolden his heart to approach me? The word of Hashem, you will be a people unto me, and I will be God unto you. Okay? For behold, the storm of Hashem, a rage, a rage shall go forth, time shall seek, rest, it will rest upon the head of the victim. Here he's telling them, remember, Jeremiah is telling them about their punishments and also what's going to happen. Hashem's burning wrath will not recede until he's accomplished it, and until it has upheld the plans of that other side. In the end of days, you will be able to understand it. At that time, the word of Hashem, I will be a God for all the families of Israel, and they will be people unto me. So all this is going to happen at the end of times, it says specifically then. Okay? Again, in here we see multiple, multiple things, which already, some of you are going to mention. Return from the exile, the Davidic king, the first time we mentioned here, but we'll see it again. Everybody serve Hashem, Hashem will be God's people, we've seen this mentioned before. Hashem will be Israel's God. 
all these, again, we've already seen these things happen again, and we've seen more and more of these, but I'm just being one to say specifically, they're talking about the end of times. And here when it mentions David, it's just incidentally, oh, you're going to have a ruler's name from the Davidic king. Incidentally, you know, you're going to have somebody. But it's not about David. All the discussion is about the time. And also, you should know, you're going to have a ruler that I'm going to choose out from amongst you. Okay? I see we're coming to the end of time. Um, I will look, if you have any questions you had in the thing that are in, in, in the box there that relate, um, we'll, we'll deal with that next time. Okay. But uh, <clears throat> we've done three. We have two more prophecies to do All right. um, that are explicit, and then, you know, we'll take over from there. That sounds good. All right, Rabbi. Well, it's been a great show. I uh, look forward to seeing you in two weeks. Actually, I'm going to be out of town next week, so... Uh, that's going oh. to wrap me up, so I'll give you a week off, all right? Oh, okay. That's so. interesting to know. Very good, very good. Like, give you plenty of notice, at least. So. Yeah, oh, that's that's fine. Unfortunately, people are pretty upset about it. So we'll uh, we'll see you guys all in two weeks then. And, Rabbi, I hope you have a great week yourself. And we'll see you guys on yeah. the other side. Shavuot to everybody. Okay. Thanks, bye-bye. Shove